The Old Walls by Sven Pertelsen These walls are old. They were old before the Vikings landed in Vinland. They were deserted before Columbus mistook the continent for India. Settlers' log cabins have decayed and blown away as dust while these walls have watched over the valley. Western towns have sprung up and been abandoned while they remain. Now weeds and trees break up the interstates. Roofless ruins of suburbs are the home to wild dogs and glassless skyscrapers stand like broken teeth emerging from the waves in the coastal cities. The valley below the cliffs is green with fresh grass. The sagebrush and desert plants replaced by new fields for crops and grazing. Earth is a wetter place since the oceans rose. Many of those who survived the decades without summers moved away from the old towns and cities looking for places to farm and settle in peace. Peace was not easy to find in the early days. Bands of nomads using the last of the fuel and vehicles raided and plundered any undefended farms, unless they were well hidden and away from the roads. Even out here, in the what had been wilderness, the first settlers had to fight off attacks. When firearms and ammunition had run out, older forms of weapon had to suffice. Generations had passed, but there was still a lookout posted at the top of the cliff. These days the lookout only carried a bow and arrows for defence and a horn to sound the alarm. No one could remember the last time the horn had sounded in earnest. Lowell watched the sundial creep slowly round to noon, and noticed that the sand had almost run through the timer, another quarter hour. Lookout duty was boring, but it was still easier than ploughing or weeding. Time to lift the ancient binoculars and check out the horizon for the last time in his watch. Then he could yell out the noon all clear and Freddy would make his way from the clifftop camp and relieve him. Just as long as Freddy had not scoffed all the lunch, again. It was Trinia's turn to cook today and Lowell's mouth watered. When he was old enough, she would make a great wife. As he was about to put down the binoculars, Lowell noticed a faint dust cloud, perhaps a mile or so away, to the southwest, near to where the old town of Camp Verde had been. The nearest settlement in that direction was Prescott. Could be a trading party from there. The old telescope gave him a better view. They were just approaching a bend in the river, three loops upstream. Five or so riders and a wagon. No flag, though. Prescott folk always carried a green flag. Lowell hesitated with his hand on the horn around his neck. Raising it to his mouth, he blew. It sounded like a tiny kitten came out of the horn. His mouth had gone suddenly dry. A quick squeak from his canteen, and the alarm horn sang out over the cliffs and fields. Faces peered up from the fields below. Freddy, Trini, and Carla came at a run from the nearby camp. Lowell pointed at the approaching group and looked through the telescope while Carla pulled the red semaphore flags from their container. Five, no, six riders and a wagon, about a mile and a half southwest, no flag showing, Lowell said. Carla's arms worked the flags and below them horses were being saddled and arms handed out. Two teams of oxen were being harnessed to the barriers that could be pulled across the main path in and out of the settlement and already a line of armed villagers were assembling there. As soon as the village riders headed out along the path, the oxen started pulling the heavy spiked barriers into place, leaving only a gap wide enough for a single rider to pass. Another short fence was being manhandled into place behind the gap. All Lowell and the other lookouts could do was to watch and wait.
The Old Walls, Part 2, by Sven Pertelson Lowell watched through the telescope as the village riders met the incoming group, making his comments to Carla, who relayed them by semaphore to the village below. All friendly, so far, he said. He carefully watched the left hand and head of George, the foremost rider and village leader. Village security was one of the subjects everyone paid attention to during school hours. The teacher made them all memorize that piece of poetry by an ancient writer called Kipling from one of the cherished books in the village library. If I had raised my bridle hand as I have had it l held it low, the little jackals that flee so fast were feasting all in a row. If I had bowed my head on my breast as I have held it high, the kite that whistles above us now were gorged till she could not fly. They're bringing up to the village, Lowell told Carla. But we're to stay alert. He's not given the all clear. Only if George lifted his right hand would they assume that the visitors were truly harmless. If he raised his left hand at any time, then the archers at the barrier would fire as soon as they were in range. Lowell kept on watching as the party came up to the barrier. Far below, George lifted his right hand and gestured for the gate to be opened. Lowell breathed a sigh of relief and sang out, All clear, Clara. Suddenly everyone was talking at once. I wonder who they are. Where have they come from? When can we get down there? More questions than answers. Lowell asked one more. Can I have my lunch now? And added, We'll have to wait until sundown, until the next watch comes up to find out. In the meantime, it's your turn on watch, Freddy. I hope it's less exciting than mine. Trina brought Lowell's bow of steam scum gullion to the cliff edge, so they could watch the activity in the village below. As they sat together, they watched the visitors unsaddle their horses and unhitch the mule team from the wagon, and let them loose in the paddock next to the wooden village meeting hall. Apart from the feed barns, the hall was the only large building in the village. The ancient cliff buildings were where everyone slept and cooked. The hall doubled as the school, when the children were not needed to help in the fields, and also accommodation for the rare visitors they had. No outsiders were allowed up into the cliff dwellings. He had to know the route to climb there safely. And one past bad experience with a group they had trusted with that knowledge had been enough. They'd managed to rescue four of the six teenage girls that group had abducted. One of them had been Lowell's great-grandmother, and his grandmother the result of the sad event. Villagers were crowding round the wagon, helping the visitors move large packs and crates into the hall. Oh, wished he could borrow the binoculars or telescope to see more detail. But they had to stay with the watchkeeper. Those were the rules. Soon everyone below moved into the hall. Lowell and Trina went to help Carla pack up their belongings from the cliff-top camp. The sun was beginning to drop towards the horizon, and soon they might find out what was going on. As the sun set, the new group of watchkeepers came into camp. They did not look pleased. "'What's going on down there?' Carla asked. "'We wish you knew,' came the reply. "'George said it would be something to remember, but won't say what's going to happen tonight. "'But he did promise we could come down tomorrow night and find out.' "'As soon as the new group relieved Freddy at the lookout, "'they started making their way down the hill towards the path to the village. "'It would be fully dark by the time they got there, and the anticipation was unbearable.' George met the returning watchkeepers as they entered the village. There were handshakes and hugs for them all. You all did very well, George said, and as a thank you, we've set aside seats of honour for you at tonight's event. Lowell could not resist asking, Just what is going on tonight? George smiled and replied, It is a secret, but I assure you that it will be memorable. You better go and get washed up and fed and get into your best clothes. Lowell and the others walked down to the river 
and the steam lodge and bathhouse that lay just as it left the village. These days they were a little more self-conscious about being naked with members of the opposite sex, but the rough woven towels you needed to sit on in the steam lodge were just large enough to allow a little modesty, and the communal bath was just deep enough. As they sat and relaxed they discussed what tonight's event might be. Carla and Trina hoped it might be a dance, and knew who it was that they wanted to dance with. Lowell and Freddy thought it might be a play. Make a change to have one done by people they did not know, just as long as it was not Shakespeare, again. Clean and relaxed, they climbed up the cliff to their parents' home and dumped their packs. The smell of cooking drifted between the close-packed rooms. Lowell sniffed the air. Someone was having chilli, and somebody else chicken. He changed his clothes and made his way to his mother's kitchen. Over the charcoal brazier he could see part of a jointed chicken browning nicely. Hugged his mother and reached for a chicken leg. You just wait till your father gets here, she smiled. He's gone to swap some chicken for some yams Carla's mother is cooking. Lowell thought dinner would never finish. He was anxious to get down the cliff to find out just what the evening held. Eventually, after cleaning their plates, he and his parents joined the other families climbing down to the hall. The hall was dark and crowded. Only a few oil lamps were lit and it was hard to see. Perhaps it was going to be a play. Odd hissing and wheezing sounds came from an open door to the side of the hall. A thick rope led from the door to a large box at the rear of the hall. On the small stage a large white sheet hung from the rafters. What was going on? George greeted Lowell and pointed him to one of four seats vacant at the front. Carla and Trina and Freddy joined him. George made his way to the stage and started to speak. Tonight we are happy to greet our visitors from the seaport of Palm Springs. They have a large and thriving settlement there and are travelling the country to establish trading relationships with smaller groups like us and Prescott. They brought with them one of the marvels that they've managed to produce through their trading and engineering advances. I'll shut up now and let them get started. From outside the hall, the sound of hissing and creaking increased and was joined by a whirring and crackling sound from the rear of the hall. A bright light appeared on the white sheet and numbers counted down on the screen. The hall was filled with the sound of music, and a giant lion appeared on the screen and roared. The lion vanished and was replaced by a picture of a cat and a mouse, and the words, Tom and Jerry. Amazement was followed by laughter at the antics of the creatures, and all the visitors showed four films. The one that caused most excitement was the final one. It started with a tall tower that spouted flame at its base and rose into the sky. The ancient voice explained it was travelling to the moon. It ended with a man stepping down a ladder and saying something about a small step for a man. The leader of the visitors from Palm Springs got up on stage to speak after the show. It may be many generations before a man steps on the moon again. We will work to bring useful medicines, tools, machines, and other advances to the world. We've learned from the errors of the past, and will do so in harmony with the planet. This is a new beginning. <laughs>